So if you have the Bible this morning, you want to join me in the book of Revelation. We've been there for the past few weeks. We're going to continue our study through Revelation, hitting on some of the major subjects within the book. And so I hope that you uh, have come expecting. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 is where we are today. While you make your way there, give me a few moments and we'll make our way to the text. I want to start today's sermon by sharing with you, well, let me begin by saying we're going to address the 144,000 that are represented in the book of Revelation. My guess is that at some point in time you have heard of that number, have recognized that number has some connection in the end, and have probably heard it connected with other religions as well. So today what I want to share with you is simply show you what the book of Revelation has to say about this number and this group of people that numbers 144,000. But before we get there, I want to start by sharing this story with you. In 2001, there was a book written by Jerry Jenkins called Are We Living in the End of Time? And in that book, he tells a story that in Portland, Oregon, the oldest running West Coast newspaper ran a series of stories under this headline, Christian Persecution Widespread and Complex. And the series began with these three headlines. Listen carefully. The first one said this, Presbyterian pastor starts the first ever congregation in Pakistan. When discovered, the mobs destroyed his church, masked men invaded the pastor's home, and stabbed him to death. The headline number two read that a man leaves Islam and becomes a Christian in Egypt. The Egyptian secret police arrest him without charges, torture him with an electric probe in order to get more information about other converts. Headline three read, a young Catholic boy in Sudan was playing in, tre in the trees with his friends when they were kidnapped and forced into Islam given new names, and, uh, and their master's wives were allowed to beat them with sticks. You may be thinking, that's a very disheartening way to start today's sermon. But I want you to realize that these types of stories, while, are, while they're becoming all too commonplace even in today's time, these stories happened back in 1998, which is 20 years ago, or a little more than that now. And I want you to recognize that while those stories and those headlines sound horrific, they will pale in comparison to the types of things you will see during this final time of tribulation that the Bible has been speaking of, that we have been addressing. So church family, what I want you to know today is this. I want you to realize that a book written 20 years ago, it seems frightful and it seems almost daunting, but I want you to know this. We don't need to look to something written 20 years ago. We need to look to something written 2,000 years ago. Amen. Amen. So the, the, the Word of God is going to make very clear to us who this group of 144,000 people are. Let me catch you up to speed because I know many of you attend outdoors and still haven't um, come to our indoor services, so you may have missed the past couple of weeks. So let me do a fast recap. You guys can listen fast, right? <laughs> So a few weeks ago, we discovered and we discussed and we addressed the issue of the Antichrist from Revelation chapter 13. I actually read a story this week or read a, um, a poll this week that said that more people in America would be willing to attend a church service when they know the subject matter is going to be who is the Antichrist more so than we're willing to attend over who is Jesus Christ. Let that sink in. But we address this subject of the Antichrist. I share with you how he will rise to power very quickly. He will come seemingly out of nowhere. The Bible tells us that he will have some sort of deadly wound to his head that will be miraculously healed. The world will hail him as their hero, their temporary savior. They won't, they won't just see him as some type of political figure but they will literally see him as the new savior of the world. He will spur and head up the one world government, a one world economy, and a one world religion. You may remember that I also shared with you how he will seek to mark everyone with his marking that the Bible calls the number of a man. 
that number being 666. He will do this for the purpose of buying and or selling, the purpose of commerce and the purpose of going out and coming. The Bible tells us that three and a half years into the seven year period of tribulation where this antichrist, this the Bible calls him the beast, the world will call him savior, emperor, leader, they won't call him beast or antichrist. But the Bible tells us that three and a half years in to this seven year period of tribulation, he will, he will perform something that no one has been able to do. And that is that he will kill these two witnesses that we also discussed that I'm going to address again in just a moment. And then he will march himself into the temple in Jerusalem. And he will announce not only he will announce not that he is the leader of the world. He will announce not that he is the new emperor or the new president. He will announce that he is God himself. Then two weeks ago, we looked at these two witnesses from Revelation chapter 11. The Bible tells us that during this period of tribulation that there will be these two guys preaching. We believe that they will probably stand outside the Jerusalem temple at what we call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. And no one will be able to kill them and everyone's going, or a lot of people are going to hate what they have to say. They're going to preach a message that is going to be directly in opposition to this Antichrist. While this Antichrist is going to rally the world with peace. He's going to come proclaiming peace to the world. And he's going to rally a lot of people. But these two witnesses are going to be able to tell the world that what he's telling you isn't true. They're going to continue to preach the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to be seen by everyone. If you were here, I, I showed you a actual camera picture outside the Wailing Wall where it is being uh, videotape 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year right now. And there's nothing to even video. But we believe that when these guys come on the scenes, this is probably where they will be and the whole world will be able to see them. Then three and a half years in, this Antichrist is going to kill these two dudes. The Bible tells us that no one will be able to kill them and anyone who tries, the fire from their mouth will consume them. And then this Antichrist at the three and a half year mark kills these two dudes. And this is what makes everyone agree with him when he announces to the world that he is God. Because no one's been able to kill him. Military couldn't do it. Snipers couldn't do it. The Navy SEALs couldn't do it. Everybody tried and nobody could do it. And they continue throughout this three and a half year or throughout this period to preach the message of the gospel. Then the Bible tells us that they will die in the street at the hands of this Antichrist. He will then march into the temple, announce to the world that he is God, and allow these witnesses' dead bodies to lay in the streets, to which everyone will then be in agreement with that this dude is God. And while their bodies lay there for three and a half days, the Bible tells us that they have this almost fake or uh, imitation Christmas where everyone's celebrating and giving each other's gifts that these two witnesses have died. And then their bodies will be miraculously resurrected to heaven. And everyone will see this happen. And at which time many people are going to come to Christ and recognize the power of God. And there's going to be an absolute chaos going on across the globe. And last week I introduced to you this idea or this picture that we have here in Revelation of the seven seal judgments. John, showed, John says to us in Revelation that he saw a picture into heaven and he saw around the throne a scroll that no one could read and no one could open. And then Jesus himself takes this scroll that is sealed up seven times. And he breaks each seal and each time he reveals what's inside this seal. Let me help you to understand the book of Revelation a little bit better right here. Revelation shares with us 21 judgments of God. It is broken down into three sections of sevens. We have seven seal judgments. We have seven trumpet judgments and seven bowl judgments. And we see here that during these seven seal judgments, we are introduced to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We see a judgment being, marked, being ushered in by them. Then we saw the martyred saints around the throne of God who had been killed during this tribulation period. And then we saw that the world naturally has been thrown into chaos. The Bible tells us that during this time, 
The sun will become dark and the moon will be as if it is blood. Islands will be displaced and land masses will be moved. Literally, the world will be in chaos. So today, most of you have probably heard, and if you haven't, you've probably at least had some understanding or some point in your life been introduced to the idea that the number 144,000 people has some significance to the end. So I'm going to share it with you today. As I do each week, I want to give you the main point of the text. It's a little lengthy today because I try to summarize it all for you in one sentence, but just listen carefully. The message of the gospel will never be silenced or stopped. And God's love for both Jew and Gentile is clear even in the end. The message of the gospel will never be silenced and it will never be stopped. And God's love for both Jew and Gentile is clear even in the end. You want to stand with me today while we read Revelation chapter 7? We're going to read verses 1 through 12. Bear with me as I read today because some of this reading seems as if it's just information, but it is needed and we must hear it today. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And he said, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. The tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Reuben, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Gad, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Asher, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Simeon, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Levi, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Ishakar, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 sealed. The tribe of Joseph, 12,000 sealed. And finally, the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great number, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And they were crying out with loud voices, saying, Salvation belongs to God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, that is Jesus. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell before their faces in the throne, and they worshiped God, saying this, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that today, just like in the end, you are in total control. Lord, I ask that you would help us today to understand this often difficult book, and the often difficult subject of the 144,000. Lord, give me a sharp mind, a clear tongue, and a passion to preach. Lord, let it be contagious to those around us. And let my love for you be clear. Lord, I pray today that you would honor the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, the hearing of your word, and our obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated this morning. During the seven-year period of tribulation, the Bible tells us that there will be a group of people numbering 144,000 that will be sealed. They will be sealed by God and no one is going to be able to harm them. They will be sealed by God to carry out the message of the gospel. I don't think you and I often understand how large 144,000 is. A group of people numbering 144,000, we often just hear the number and we just go on about our lives. But let me break it down for you so you get a, a better picture. 144,000 would be almost twice of Lincoln County. Every single person who lives in this county times two. The largest football stadium in America is the University of Michigan. 
at Ann Arbor. It seats 107,420 people. In the largest basketball arena is the Syracuse Carrier Dome that seats 33,000 people. We can fill them both up and we still don't have 144,000 people. To put it in a little more local perspective, it would take 640 West Lincoln High graduating classes to get to 144,000 graduating classes. If we took all the churches that make up the South Mountain Baptist Association, all 28 churches that could form our local association, and we took every member, not just those who attend, but every member of every church, we would need to rally all our churches together, and then we would need to multiply it by 32. So we would need to gather up all 28 of our churches and have every member there and then we would need to replicate that 32 more times. This is how large the number of 144,000 people is. If we filled up our own church here at Mount Vernon and we sat shoulder to shoulder in the sanctuary and each week we brought a new group of people in until 144,000 people could hear the gospel. And we did this every week, shoulder to shoulder in the sanctuary. The next week, a whole new group. The next week, a whole new group. It takes us seven years to get there. Now, do you understand how large this group of people is? Often we hear a number like 144,000 and we just go on about our business. But today I want you to see how, how critical and how big and how powerful and how important this group of people is going to be during this tribulation time. This group of people is going to lead what many scholars believe to be the greatest revival the world has ever seen. Most of us think that it, it, when the church is raptured, harpezioed away from here, and we're no longer here, and, the church, and then people are going through this great tribulation, that everyone is just going to be damned during this time. But the Bible seems to indicate to us that there's going to be a lot of people come to understand the power of God. And come to understand who Christ is during this time. These 144,000 people are going to go about sharing the gospel. Those two witnesses that we have seen, they're going to preach the gospel. Why would God allow this to happen unless there are going to be people responding to their message? There will never be a time, and there has never been a time, where God did not have a messenger on this earth to share his hope of the gospel. Chapter 7 of Revelation breaks down into two sections. First, verses 1 through 8 show us a vision for the Jews. Verses 9 to the end of the chapter shows us a vision for the Gentiles. Actually, this chapter, if you read the book of Revelation straight through, you might get lost here. And one of the reasons is because of this. There is a Revelation pause each time in the book of Revelation that you get God pouring out his judgments in between the sixth and seventh judgment, he introduces us to something new. And in this case, what we see is this. God is introducing and showing us the seven seal judgments being broken. We have been introduced to six of them. Then John takes a pause, and in between six and seven, he introduces us to this 144,000 people. So let's look at the text together. First, I want you to see that God is in full control even over nature. Verses 1 through 3 show us that there was angels at the four corners of the earth. Let me clarify that that does not justify that we live on a flat earth. <laughs> we obviously live on a round earth. and This is representative that he had an angel at all four points of the compass. A north angel, a south angel, an east angel, and a west angel. And the Bible tells us that these guys were literally holding back the wind. Remember what I told you about those two witnesses? One of their strengths or one of their gifts is that God allows them to actually hold back the rain. And if you remember, for three and a half years, the earth sees no rain fall on it. Now we have the angels holding back the wind. As if it wasn't bad enough that we don't have rain, now we don't even have the wind blowing during this time. And people are not able to find any relief. And then in the east, a fifth angel shows up. And he brings with him, the Bible calls it, the seal of God. And he's going to seal 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. 
Now, there's a lot of people out there that believe that this number is just symbolic, that it represents a large group of people, that it just represents the church and the redeemed of Israel. I'm going to share with you why I personally disagree with that. I disagree with it because God seems to go to great lengths in chapter 7 to show us exactly who they are. He even tells us that he heard the number and then he sees the number being fulfilled throughout the tribes of Israel. Now that seems to be going to a lot of trouble if it was just going to be just a mass of people. Why not just say a mass of people? So I believe, call me a simpleton, but I just believe that what God said here is actually what he meant here. Y'all with me on this? <laughs> so what we see is this fifth angel showing up. Do you guys remember how I told you that everything God does, Satan wants to copy, and everything God has, Satan wants it? Remember how I've shared with you this with you over and over? That everything God has, Satan wants it. Everything God does, Satan tries to copy it. Well, guess what? Many of you have often wondered and have even asked me a lot about this whole mark of the beast lately and this whole idea of this antichrist marking people. Remember how I showed you that the Bible tells us that the dragon is what he refers to, it was what Satan is referred to in Revelation. He tries to mimic God. Then he gets this beast, antichrist, to mimic Jesus. Then he has this false prophet to mimic the Holy Spirit. Then they even created an image, remember this, that everyone would look to, and it mimics the cross. And then we even saw that they were making this fake Christmas almost to celebrate gifts giving. It almost masks Christmas. Well, guess what we see here? We see that God sealed up his Jewish nation to his Jewish believers here, 144,000 of them, and he put the seal of God on their foreheads. That's what it says here in the text, that he sealed them. Verse 3 says, the angel came with the seal of God. Look at verse 3 at the end. Don't harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. So why in the world did the Antichrist even ever have this whole mark of the beast? Once again, he wants to copy what God is doing. And what we see here is Jewish converts being sealed on their foreheads. A lot of, a lot of people that I read from this week, a lot of videos that I tried to watch and get caught up on my background of understanding this book, all, all seem to believe that these Jewish people are going to be sealed on their foreheads and nobody's going to be able to see it. Like, that makes no sense. Why would God seal them on their foreheads and nobody's able to see it? Well, I believe that what we see here is God sealing these Jewish people, protecting these Jewish people, and allowing them to understand that he is God and allowing them to be redeemed and to go out into the earth and to share the hope of the gospel. It is just my belief and understanding of scripture that the reason the Antichrist then begins to mark people with his marking is because God has already marked his people with his marking. And he wants to do everything that God does. But we see here first that God is even in full control over nature as he holds back the winds. And we see that he has this idea of marking people. In scripture, this is not a new concept. People have been marked all through scripture. If you back up to Genesis 4, we see that God put a mark on Cain after he killed his brother. And we see that in Genesis 6, God sealed up Noah and his family in the ark to protect them. You may remember in Exodus 12, when we look at the Passover, that the marking of the blood on the doorpost protected you from the Passover or during the Passover. In Ephesians 1, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, God tells us that we have been sealed and protected by the seal of the Holy Spirit. I love these outdoor services, but I hate turning pages in the wind. <laughs> it has been quite a challenge. Paul even said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that the solid foundation of God stands having this seal, that the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who belongs to him depart from a life of sin. We see that God is in control, and we see that this idea of sealing people is not foreign in Scripture. But then in verse 4, we see that God's heart for saving people is on display even in the end. Here we see that God seals up 144,000 people, and he does it from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Now, I'm not going to sit here and just reread them to you, but I want to I want to see an actual show of hands because, because you may be just like I am. When I read to you verses 5 through 8, and I showed you or read to you the 12 tribes of Israel and how God would redeem 12,000 from each tribe, did anybody in here catch that they were, they were based on the Old Testament, that they were listed out of order? There's like three of us in here, right? I can't even tell you how many times I read it and didn't realize, wait a minute, this is bad out of order, and there's even one missing. What is going on here? So let me, let me entertain you with things that excite me that doesn't exactly excite everyone else. <laughs> These are the types of things that make me run around in the church while y'all aren't here. <laughs> These are the things that leave me pumping my fist in my office and, and going, yes, that is too cool. Here we are. Reuben, in verse 5, the tribe of Reuben, Reuben is the firstborn and he should be listed first. Why does Judah get bumped from the fourth child to the first? Because Jesus came from the line of Judah. So I think here that this is just God's way of reminding everybody of who the real Christ is. Amen. That he, he, he introduces the 12 tribes of Israel and he starts out with the one that Jesus came from. And then he leaves out. Did anybody catch who was left out here? You Old Testament scholars. I'm going to be impressed if you caught it. The, the grouping or the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. It's left out and it's replaced with the tribe of Manasseh. Why? Dan led the children of Israel into idolatry and therefore forfeit their section in the end. And what we see here is that God is sealing his people. He has allowed Judah to be listed first here because Jesus come from that line. And he has omitted Dan because he led the people into, into idolatry. I love the way Charles Spurgeon said it about this listing of people. Spurgeon said most people read this as nothing more than a list of people. Most people read this and just see it as Old Testament historical names. But the truth of this listing is this, that the listing of the tribes is proof, oh, this is good, it is proof that in the end, the first and the last will all worship together. Amen. Did you catch that? Even Benjamin, who is last in line, will be able to worship right alongside the tribe of Judah who brought forth our Messiah. Then verses 9 through 12 show us the results of these 144,000 people. It appears based on the timing and the placement of this in Scripture that these 144,000 Jews will lead a massive revival that will result in the salvation of countless numbers of people, as I've already shared with you. These people will come from all walks of life. But let's look at this as we wrap this up, as we get closer to the end of the sermon. Verse 9 says, after these things, after what things? After these things, after he has witnessed all of this and saw these people being sealed, after these, John says, I looked, and behold, I saw a great number which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne, before Jesus, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So what we conclude is this. God seals up an exact number here. We see 144,000 people sealed. But then John says, when I looked out from the throne of God, I saw a multitude that no one could count. This is another reason why I conclude that this is the exact number that is needed. Because here, John tells us that after this, I looked and saw a multitude which no one could count. Look where they're from. Verse 9 says, no one could number them. They were from all nations, all tribes, all people, and all tongues. And they were standing before the throne. I believe here that we see the results of the 144,000, and that is that they are leading a massive revival during this time of tribulation. But verse 9 also says at the end of the verse, did y'all catch what they were doing, or what they had in their hands? Palm branches. Palm branches. Do you remember the only other time in the New Testament where we saw palm branches being waved? Y'all remember this? 
on the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem on the Passion Week. We call it Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. You know why we, uh, here at Mount Vernon, we let our kids march in on Palm Sunday, holding palm branches in their hands. Some of them like to wave them, some of them just like to hold them. Some of them just hold on to it, walk up and sit it at the cross. Others of it wave it, and some of them smack each other in the face with them. <laughs> That's what kids do, right? You know why we do that? Because it is representative of what we see here. That when they, they wave these palm branches in, in Jewish life, it was a signal. It was signifying of hailing someone as their king. It was hailing someone as their new leader. And here we see that in the end, across the, the throne of God, they looked out and what did they see? They saw people with palm branches in their hands, waving them to signify who the real Christ is. Verse 10 shows us their worship. Verse 11 shows us that the angels too worship. And then verse 12 shows us that we see the words of God or the words representative of who God is here. After the 144,000 lead this massive revival and they're in heaven, look at what it says about God. It says, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. These are the words he uses to describe God. Glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. Those sound like adjectives that don't describe a whole lot of us. Powerful, mighty, worthy, not any of us. But these are the, these are the adjectives that we see describing God. Words very fitting for God. So in conclusion, who are these 144,000 people mentioned here in Revelation 7? They are sealed, saved, and protected Jewish converts, 12,000 from each of the tribes listed. What will they do? They will preach the message of the gospel in order to fulfill what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to me, and then the end will come. Where will these people be? Where will these 12,000 sealed up people even be? I believe that when God seals them, that they will then do their best to travel the globe as, but, as, as much as you will be able to during that time to preach the unstoppable message of Christ to all who will hear. So basically, church... Basically, they're going to do exactly what we should be doing right now. If you can't say amen, just say oh me. They're going to be going across the globe, preaching the message of the gospel to everyone that they possibly can. Where will they do it? Globally. Why are they doing it? Because God's worthy to have it done. What will their message even be? It will be simply put, Jesus Christ crucified, dead, dead. Buried, raised, and coming again, and it will be evidently clear during that time. Dr. David Jeremiah, in my conclusion, he said it this. He said it this way. There's a lot of S's in this sentence, so listen carefully. He said the 144,000 will be selected, sealed, separated, strong, spared, secure, and successful and when arriving in heaven, they will sing a new song. Today, church family, you have been informed and heard of these 144,000 Jewish converts. But the real question on the table today is not who are these 144,000. The real question on the table today is, are you a convert of Jesus Christ? That's the real question on the table. You may be asking, who are these people? Where are these people? What are these people going to do? But the real question on the table today is, do you follow Christ? Has Christ changed your heart? Have you been converted? Have you been redeemed and saved from your life of sin and abandoned your life of sin? If so, you can call yourself a follower of Christ. That's the real question on the table today. Yes, things are going to be terrible in the end. Yes, they're going to be awful. Yes, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yes, it's going to be horrific, painful, worse than we could even imagine for those who are here during this tribulation time. But rest assured today, you can know Christ, the one true King. You can know Christ, the one true Savior. You can repent of your sin today, trust Christ to save you, and he promises to hold you firmly in the palm of his hand. So as I said just a moment ago, 
The question on the table isn't who are the 144,000. The question on the table is do you belong to Christ? The message of the gospel will never be silenced. It will never be stopped. And God's love for both Jew and Gentile is clear even in the end. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together today in conclusion. I'm going to pray for us, and after I pray, um, we'll be dismissed today. Don't forget, church family, um, you see these white buckets sitting around? Uh, that's for your offering. Don't forget, if you would like to participate in helping Heidi's Pumpkin Patch throughout the October um, season, or throughout the October month, make sure that you grab one of these envelopes up here as well. You may see the flower at the foot of our, our stand today. These flowers placed here in honor of Miss Joanne Powers, who is currently residing with Jesus right now. Um, she's not waiting to meet him. She's with him now. And uh, so you guys, you see this flower here. Brother Paul put this here in her honor. So if you see Brother Paul throughout the, the coming weeks, make sure that you try to encourage him, pray for him, and love on him in the loss of his wife. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you that we get to study the book of Revelation together. Lord, we confess to you that sometimes it seems overwhelming. Lord, today maybe there's people here who've never even heard of this 144,000. Lord, there are other denominations, other religions who believe that this is, these are the only people going to heaven. And God, that's just not true. God, help us to recognize that during this tribulation time, you're going to protect your servants, and you're going to protect them to share the hope of the gospel. But Lord, that's not today, at least not yet. And so God, today, while we have the opportunity, let us be your servants and let us serve you well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.